Alrighty. So, for the past couple of lectures, we've been talking about transactions. We've been talking about how uh, different processes can interact in the in the uh, database at the same time to manipulate uh, data in a way that is uh, basically to let everyone play together in a nice happy environment. And uh, today we're going to take that one step further. So what happens when uh, the, the processes are not actually on the same uh, physical device? How do we take a database and split it up across lots and lots of different physical machines? Uh, Basically, how do we do, do parallelism? How do we do replication? Uh, before that, I hope everyone has had a chance to take a look at the uh, checkpoint three re requirements. Um, today, we're going to start off uh, briefly discussing uh, what is involved in those. Um, so uh, please interrupt with any questions that you might have. Um, from a really high level, what's uh, let, let's take a look at what's uh, different in Checkpoint 3. Uh, the first is that you now have access to a open source indexing library, um, JDBM2. Uh, if you're familiar with Berkeley DB, uh, it's essentially the same basic concept. Uh, and loosely, the, the basic idea is that you have uh, a map, uh, an implementation of the map interface, and an implementation of the sorted map interface that is backed by a file on disk. Uh, B plus tree or a hash map specifically. Um, this is done using object serialization, so while it may not be the necessarily the most efficient way of going about this, it should be relatively easy to use and uh, reasonably efficient for the uh, scale of data that we're working with. Um, it's also fairly well documented. There's a fairly extensive Java doc, and as people start expressing questions, uh, and as uh, I'll, I'll be posting some videos like I did for uh, JSQL parser. So that said, uh, what's changed in the testing infrastructure? So the main difference here is that you have a few minutes, uh, five minutes specifically, to pre-compute, uh, to do any kind of initial uh, preparation uh, that you need to do to streamline the evaluation of the queries that you'll be uh, performing afterwards. Um, so we'll be asking you to evaluate a number of different queries, a number of different parameters, and so forth. And what uh, your responsibility is, is as, as always, answer those queries. And the, the distinction in this case is that you have a couple of minutes to, to uh, pre-process, to build indexes, uh, to build, uh, to gather statistics, uh, basically do any kind of uh, preparatory work uh, that you need. And that five minutes won't count against your time as long as you stay uh, within five minutes. And you probably won't need the entire uh, time period. So uh, that said, uh, how does the reference implementation incorporate these new uh, project constraints? So the, uh, the first distinction is that the, uh, the schemas of each of the tables that you'll be working with have been annotated with additional uh, information. Uh, primary keys and indexes, and the, the annotated version of the schemas has been uh, posted on Piazza, so you can download that and, and play with it directly. Uh, all of it is uh, parsed correctly by JSQL Parser, um, and you should be able to just access it directly through the uh, index class provided by JSQL Parser. Uh, the reference implementation uh, takes these and uh, builds two kinds of indexes, uh, a B plus tree on the primary key and a B plus tree uh, on uh, any kind of index that is explicitly called for in the uh, JSQL Parser, uh, sorry, in the uh, schema information. So uh, those schema files have been annotated with a couple of uh, suggested uh, indexes. Uh, and the reference implementation takes those indexes and builds a B plus tree uh, for each of them. Uh, these indexes then get used uh, through an index nested loop join operator. And like you had a hash join and a sort merge join operator, um, the, the reference implementation now includes an index nested loop join operator that uh, 
where one side is uh, a straight file scan operator and it converts a file scan plus an index ne uh, nested loop into, sorry, a file scan plus a join into an index nested loop join. Uh, additionally, any t uh, whenever it sees a selection predicate sitting over a file scan, it converts that into a uh, it converts that into a index scan uh, as appropriate. Uh, that basically summarizes the changes in the reference implementation. Uh, any questions up to this point? Yeah. Uh, you'll be answering queries uh, against a scaling factor one, uh, sorry, a scaling factor 0 0.1 uh, TPCH data set. So the, uh, the entire textual representation of the TPCH data set will consume 100 megabytes. Um, we may, purely for leaderboard purposes, use a uh, slightly larger data set, but that will not count towards your grade. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So the the question is uh, how is w what uh, constitutes the gap between the initial pre-computation phase and the later phases. Um, Think of, it at, think of the pre-computation phase as a separate query. So you'll get a command line argument. Uh, I believe the one in the project write-up is dash dash build. And that signifies, okay, you can, uh, whatever kind of pre-computation uh, you need to do, do that pre-computation now. Uh, you have five minutes before the, uh, before the timeout kicks in. Yes? Hard There's another argument that is provided in the write up. So the question is, uh, do you need to hard code where the indexes are located? There's another argument in the, uh, in the write up, uh, dash dash index, I believe, which signifies where, uh, which signifies a path to a direct, a writable directory where you can store your index files. Does that address your question? dash dash index directory will be passed in uh, both to the initial phase and to the later phases. So if you get dash dash index and then a path, uh, that means that you, you should expect that you have already run the pre-computation phase. So, uh, Yeah. Uh, which indexes you decided to build? Um, okay, so uh, how do you keep track of which indexes you decided to build? There, uh, the directory itself is, uh, like I said, writable, so anything you write there will stay throughout. Um, one easy way to keep track of the metadata is to essentially create a separate index file quote unquote, that contains basically all of the, the metadata that you need to keep track of. Um, another potential strategy, if the set of indexes is deterministic based on the schema, which it is for the reference implementation, um, you will be getting exactly the same schema information when you run your query. So. Uh, as, as before, you'll be getting a create table statement uh, for each table that is referenced in the query. And that create table statement will also have uh, the primary key uh, at uh, constraints, the unique, any unique constraints that, actually I don't think there are any unique constraints, but the primary key constraint and any uh, secondary index definitions as well. Um, any additional information that you want to construct, you'll have to keep track of yourself. Does that address your concern? Okay. Uh, I saw a hand somewhere. 
Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh. Uh, the reference implementation takes whichever, uh, you, so the question is, uh, does the reference impl implementation uh, use the smaller of the two relations? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, the reference implementation takes whichever relation happens to be in the correct position uh, and that has an appropriate index constructed. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you will be getting tested on all, uh, I believe we are at uh, eight queries at the moment, all eight TPCH queries that you've encountered thus far. But like I said, on a smaller data set uh, with fewer instantiations of each query, so uh, the run times will be noticeably smaller. And there will be more graders, more grading boxes available. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, the question is, will, uh, will the, uh, your submission receive a zero if you don't complete within five minutes? The answer is yes. Uh, you will not need the, if you need the entire five minutes, uh, some, you're, you're most likely doing something wrong. Um, building, building an index over a scaling factor 0.1 data set takes uh, seconds, not even uh, seconds with this system. So uh, if you're running up against that five minute limit, uh, if too many people are running up against the five minute limit, we might uh, readjust it a little bit, but my, my expectation at this stage, like the reference implementation builds all of the primary indexes uh, in less than 30 seconds. So, uh, that's, yeah, that shouldn't be a huge issue. Yes? Yes, so you are, um, while in general is, uh, the, the correct way to do this would be to modify the, um, to modify the schema definition file. Uh, just the infrastructure at the moment doesn't quite support that, so feel free to hard code anything that would normally go into the schema definition file uh, in, your, in your code. Any other questions? I had a couple of brief uh, slides just to uh, renew a couple of definitions. Um, so just recall uh, there are two types of indexes. Clustered indexes, unclustered in indexes, what's the difference? The, the, uh, someone, uh, hand? I know a whole bunch of people uh, uh, said the right answer. I just wanna, uh, everyone spoke o over each other, so. Anyone want, yeah? Uncl uh, unclustered indexes have pointers to the clustered index. So the clustered index acts as a primary store for the data. The unclustered indexes act as a secondary uh, way of accessing the data. Um, J JDBM2 instantiates this using two different types of uh, map implementations. Uh, one set of these is called uh, primary index and the second is called um, well, secondary index. Uh, there are a handful of different types of primary index. So there's uh, not only the, um, there's hash, tree, and there's another one um, uh, called uh, primary store index. That one's, uh, you can think of it kind of like a uh, tree index, but well, the, the documentation on there, uh, there, there is, the documentation can do a much better job of describing that than I can in the next five minutes. Um, think of it kind of like a tree index, uh, an unclustered B plus tree index. 
So it'll, it'll effectively uh, instantiate all of the data uh, independently uh, and then instantiate uh, a, B, a clustered B plus tree above it. Um, the advantage there is that if you have really large uh, tuples, they don't need to get unserialized as you're scanning through the B plus tree. It's probably not going to uh, matter uh, for this assignment, but uh, one, one degree of freedom to play with. Um, so we, we went over a couple of weeks ago how indexes get used. Uh, the index is a way of organizing the data, and then there's also a question of how the, the data is laid out. Uh, this impacts your file scan operator, basically. So you might have, uh, if you start building these indexes, you'll probably have two different instantiations of the data. Uh, one instantiation coming from the raw files that you're reading from, and then one instantiation, uh, actually, the, if you build a clustered index, then that in and of itself will be one representation of the data. So um, there might even be advantages to uh, doing implementing your file scans directly over the index, even though it's not sort necessarily sorted. Um, a little more terminology, uh, access paths. Uh, we talked about uh, how uh, there are different ways of accessing the data. This is basically where most of the work in this assignment is going to come in, um, picking which select uh, which uh, components of your query plan can be instantiated more efficiently, and that's going to depend on which indexes you've built, as well as which uh, what the query itself is. Um, really, the the big question is how do we pick which index? Um, once again, the the kind of big picture uh, view of this uh, for this assignment, you're kind of You've already got kind of most of this infrastructure in place. So for this assignment, really the, the main uh, chunk of the work that you're going to be most likely doing is in that optimizer phase. So any last questions about checkpoint three? Uh, that is actually a typo. Um, that was, sorry, not a typo, but uh, slightly out of date. Uh, we, we ended up deciding to include a couple of indexes in the, um, a couple of index definitions in the schema file itself. And the reference implementation doesn't go above and beyond those. Um, but by all means, if, uh, if you think that there are additional indexes that you could benefit from, uh, there's nothing stopping you from uh, effectively changing the set of indexes in the schema definition file if you think that it will benefit you. Any other questions? All right. Um, so let's move on to today's main topic, uh, parallelism. So kind of the, the first, uh, what I hope is uh, at this point, given pretty much every tech report out there, um, what I hope is pretty much the, the obvious uh, question uh, or the obvious, uh, obviously answered question, uh, why bother paralyzing? Well, uh, just to give you some vague sense of, uh, of parallelism, if I were to do a scan of one, di one file located on one hard disk drive running at the uh, SATA revision two limit of 300 megabytes per second, uh, it would take me about one hour to scan, uh, to fully scan through a full petabyte of data. One petabyte is small beans these days. Um, any major company is going to be dealing with multiple petabytes. Uh, but if I take that same file, split it over 100 drives, well, all of a sudden, I've incre uh, sorry, 1,000 drives, I've increased my bandwidth by a factor of 1,000. One hour task now takes three and a half seconds. Um, this should hopefully not be surprising to any of you at this stage, uh, but I want to include that. Um, so 
Okay, we want to spread our data out across multiple drives. We want to spread things out. We want to scale out. Um, what does that mean? Well, the first obvious question is what kind of ways do we have of scaling out? How do we take our uh, all of the things that we need to do uh, and spread them out? Well, to answer that, what, uh, we want to ask ourselves, what do we need to do? Well, there are two things that a database does. It stores data and it queries data. So how do we, uh, so then the two questions are, how do we parallelize the data and how do we parallelize uh, the, the query processing? Now, here I mostly want to just get across uh, a couple of pieces of terminology. Uh, so the, the data ends up getting parallelized in one of two ways. You can either uh, take the same data and place multiple copies of it throughout, uh, well, everywhere you're, you're parallelizing, uh, or you can take the same data and uh, spread it out across, uh, take one chunk of the data, put it on one disk, one chunk of the data, put it on another disk uh, or machine. So where, where have we heard this before? This should sound vaguely similar because we've, we've had about two or three, two, one or two lectures on this. RAID, yeah. So RAID is one of the, the uh, main reasons that I like to cover it, even though it's kind of so far, uh, so low in the, the application stack that few people actually consider it these days. Um, one of the reasons I do like to talk about it is because that's basically a form of parallelism. And um, well, we want to know how to spread our data out. So thinking back to the, the RAID lecture, why did we want to have our data on multiple different drives? Failure modes, sure. If something breaks, well, it's nice to have a backup of that data. What were some other advantages of having the, the data on multiple drives? Availability. Availability. So now if I have two different drives store, or two different machines storing the data, um, now either of those machines can respond to requests for that data. Uh, what about partitioning? What's, uh, what's so good about partitioning the data? Concurrent writes, so that increases the my ability uh, to write the system. If I have to replicate all of my data, well, now I need to uh, copy my writes. I need to make sure that my writes are safely on all of the devices that are participating in that replication scheme. So, okay, that's, that's data parallelism. We can have replication or we can have partitioning. What about operators? Um, well, when doing the query processing, there's a similar kind of uh, way that we can look at this. So if we can take our overall data processing task and we can split it up into sequential chunks, we can have each of those sequential chunks performed in a separate uh, on a separate machine or a separate thread or really all of these things are pretty much the same thing. Um, as, as an example, uh, consider a relational algebra query plan. We could put each operator on a separate device. Now that gets us some degree of parallelism because we've split, it, uh, split up the overall processing into lots and lots of smaller tasks. But why is it not a good idea to stop there? So if, if I have a relational algebra query plan and I take each relational algebra operator and assign it to a different thread, how much of a speed up am I going to get? Hmm? Well, there's some speed up if uh, 
Okay, so your um, the answer. Uh, so, you, so what you're saying is that uh, because an operator might need to wait for the output of its previous operator, uh, we might end up with uh, not getting much speed up. Uh, so, what if the operators are uh, streaming? So the um, we've discussed a handful of non-blocking operators: selection, projection. Uh, certain kinds of joins. Uh, what about those? Would those uh, kind of uh, allow you to get some degree of parallelism? And projection. And uh, what about, uh, what are some other operators? So is there uh, a join algorithm that might work, give or take? Uh, sort merge. If you don't have to do the sort merge join, uh, if you don't have to do the sort component of it, sort merge join is non-blocking. Um, what about uh, external or, sorry, what about uh, hybrid, aka grace hash join? Does that give you some degree of uh, um, non-blockingness, or under what under what conditions does that not block? So once you've built the ha built the hash table, so once you've read one side of the input, Grace hash join gets you uh, a non-blocking process. So if I'm if my operators are actually producing output at uh, output continuously, generating one tuple, then just continually generating tuples. Uh, do I, first off, do I get parallelism from assigning each operator to a separate thread? Yeah, so, so is that good enough? Am I, am I done? Can I go home? No? Okay. Damn. Um, so why? Uh, what is, uh, what's, what's the limitation there? How much parallelism am I getting here? Let's say I have uh, 10 operators. That's a reasonable size query. How much parallelism could I possibly get out of that? Right, so I can't scale past one thread for each operator. And, well, uh, if I have a million machines, but only 10 operators, well, that million machines isn't doing me much good. So uh, we also want to have a way of taking individual operators and breaking them up and processing them in parallel. parallel. Um, well, I had this nice little diagram to describe these. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, one other thing I, uh, data parallelism, right. Um, one thing I did want to uh, bring up with respect to uh, replication, actually, going a little out of order here. Uh, let me go back a couple of steps back to data parallelism. Um, one thing, uh, a couple more bi uh, pieces of terminology that I want to uh, bring in to the table. If I'm, if I'm replicating a piece of data across multiple nodes, uh, we brought up this, this issue that there is uh, a write, a, uh, I'm limited in how fast I can write to it. Now one kind of tangentially related question is how do I get that right and how do, how do I make sure that that right is successfully copied onto all of the different um, pieces of the system, uh, all of the different components that are keeping track of that uh, particular data value. And so there's um, two pieces of terminology that I want to make sure everyone is familiar with um, that specifically uh, refer to how this replication happens. Um, so we have master-slave replication, uh, where a single node basically accepts all of the connections, all of the writes go to a single node, 
and that node is responsible for kind of cloning its data to other nodes. There's also a notion of peer-to-peer -peer replication, where any node can be written to, and those nodes kind of uh, communicate amongst themselves uh, to make sure that their, their data is uh, correctly synchronized. So, quick show of hands, uh, who's taking distributed systems at some time? Okay, quite a few of you. So, you've probably heard, most of you have probably heard these terms. So, since there are so many of you, uh, what are some, uh, why would I want to do master-slave replication? Under what circumstances is that a good idea? It's easy to implement. Um, sure. Uh, there's no kind of, uh, what are some difficulties that you might not encounter uh, when, when doing master-slave re replication? In Okay, so there's no incons uh, there is, it's easier to deal with consistency issues. And why is that? Right, because all of your interactions are going through a single node, and that single node uh, can easily keep track of uh, all of the consistency issues. Now, if that's the case, uh, what, are these, what are these other nodes doing? What are the, the slaves in this uh, setting typically going to be responsible for? Serving reads? Serving reads? Okay, so sometimes, so uh, they might want, uh, they can serve reads. What are potentially, what is a potential limitation of the, the slave nodes serving reads though? Okay, so the, the master could fail potentially. What's, um, why might it be a bad idea to ask, even while the master is, is running, why might it, it be a bad idea to ask one of the slave nodes uh, to uh, perform a read? Stale data. So uh, you aren't guaranteed to get, um, the, rep the replication may not happen immediately, so the, the slave nodes may not be uh, precisely up to date. So you might be getting slightly inconsistent data. Um, yes? Right, so that, uh, that becomes a even more serious issue in peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, but if the slave nodes are providing inconsistent data, if the peer-to-peer -peer nodes are providing inconsistent data, all of my writes still have to go through this master node. Um, why would I even bother having the slave nodes if that's the case? if I need my data to be consistent. Well, uh, if, the, if the master is uh, the only one that can provide consistent reads, uh, and I, I absolutely have to have consistency, why would I bother having a bunch of slaves? Or uh, why would I bother having a, uh, even just one slave? So you, a backup. So if the server fails, I have another database that is close enough to a consistent state that it can recover and pick up where the master left off uh, practically immediately, even faster than rebooting the master. Okay, um, right, so, okay, so let's jump back to operator parallelism. So we talked about uh, two different types of parallelism. Um, sequential parallelism and uh, pipeline, sorry, pipeline parallelism and uh, what should we call it? Uh, partition parallelism. This is, to, uh, each of these are going to end up getting used in uh, most database systems. So, one of the reasons that uh, So database, databases are kind of um, very tightly coupled with this idea of parallelism for a very simple reason. Um, practically every single uh, operator in a database engine has at least some uh, native way of getting parallelized. Um, and really the, you can kind of think of databases as really the, one of the first uh, 
major software systems to get effectively paralyzed. Um, pretty much everything that has to happen in a database is bulk. You're dealing with thousands of rows, hundred, uh, hundreds of thousands of rows, millions of rows, uh, petabytes of data, but you're doing the same basic operation over all of that data. You're filtering it. You are uh, projecting away certain components of it. You're aggregating it down. And each of these are operations that are very naturally uh, parallelizable. Um, the term embarrassingly parallelizable uh, is often thrown around. And because of that, because the, the kind of basic operations that we've been discussing in a database kind of map naturally to par equivalent parallel operators, the users, don't, users of a database don't really need to think about the parallelism. Um, and that's really the, the big win. You can write a SQL query and immediately have a great way of executing that query in parallel without actually trying to uh, think, OK, uh, um, half of my data is on this server. The other half is on this server. Um, the database has enough information to figure all of that out for you. Uh, now that said, it's not all uh, skittles and beer, as they say. Uh, the major database system kind of, uh, this is Oracle, uh, DB, uh, DB2, uh, SQL Server, you generally don't encounter very large deployments of these systems. Uh, and the reason for that is that they just have really, really extensive infrastructures in place. Um, so this is kind of a very exciting time in the database community. Uh, that where we're seeing a lot of new systems come out, a lot of new uh, technology come out uh, for parallel data processing. And we're seeing a lot of cases where people kind of go back uh, to the drawing board and, and see how we can uh, take the same basic ideas and scale it up to uh, thousands, uh, even millions of database instances. And this is kind of really one of the, the really exciting areas at the moment. All right, um, so back to terminology a little. Um, the, we talked about different ways of uh, speeding, uh, different ways that we could speed up. Um, one other uh, thing that I'd like to get across is what kind of effects we're expecting to see out of that. Um, so again, uh, a little bit of terminology. This, is, this lecture is unfortunately mostly just a terminology dump. Um, the, uh, the question is, if we have a particular task, how do we make it faster. And, uh, sorry, uh, if we have a particular task, what do we, what do we mean by, the, the, uh, uh, by it scaling properly? Well, uh, one way to look at parallel uh, scaling is that we have this one task. We can perform this one task much faster as we throw more resources at the problem. We have a petabyte of data. We need to sort that petabyte of data. Um, if we get uh, if we double the number of machines, do we get twice as much performance? And so this, this kind of speed up uh, is referred to as speed up parallelism, uh, where uh, the problem size doesn't change, but by throwing more resources at it, we get um, a much better uh, performance. Now the other class here is we, we kind of scale the problem size and try and figure out what the, the, uh, how much resources we have to throw at it to get the same performance. This is known as scale up parallelism. Um, so if I have a petabyte of data and I would like to sort it, is it the case that I can uh, throw two times as many machines at it and get, uh, get that two petabytes of data sorted in the same amount of time? In this case, the answer is no. 
All right, so uh, we've defined a number of terms here. Uh, yes? Yes, um, I may have kind of swept this a little bit under. under I may have swept this a little bit under the rug. Um, the The idea is that yes, we we can't stop at just splitting across the operators. We have to actually paralyze the operators themselves. And um, I think towards the end of today's lecture, I have a little bit of a discussion of. Um, I'm going to uh, start talking about how we can do these kinds of parallelization. Um, all right, it's 5.45. Let's take a quick five minute break and then uh, we'll come back and talk about different kinds of uh, architectures and then start getting on to how to parallelize uh, the data itself. All righty, let's uh, get back to it. So, We've introduced a bit of uh, different terminology so far. Um, now I'd like to continue that and introduce a couple of different sort of fundamental architectures that you'll encounter in uh, basically in a variety of different database environments. So the first of these uh, is called shared memory. And the idea here is that you have a um, essentially a, a layer that represents your, your memory. Um, you have a lot of different processing units that can access that shared memory, and that shared memory layer is responsible for uh, performing any kind of consisten consistency checks and uh, kind of making sure that the data is where it needs to be. Now, does anyone see an immediate problem with this kind of uh, architecture? Remember the uh, the shared the idea here is that you're kind of trying to provide uh, the same interface as regular memory. Yes. Geographically uh, separated computers can't have a shared memory. Uh, Okay, so they can't have a physically shared memory, but we could potentially simulate something like this. I mean, I could have a key value store and each key is a different memory location. Um, but why, uh, so in this setting, the idea is that we kind of obscure the fact that there's any kind of uh, distribution going on here. The, that the data is just one big happy chunk of memory and we can always access it as if it were local. Uh, why is that? Why, why might that be a bad assumption? Right, so the seek time depends very heavily on what kind of, um, on where the data actually resides. And even, even if we do some kind of interesting caching, then we might end up with uh, inconsistency if we don't do that caching properly and performance issues if we do do that caching properly. So this is kind of a, a very uh, difficult model to work with. It's a very easy model to work with, but it's one that's very hard to get uh, performant simply because uh, the latency, you have very little control over uh, what kind of latency uh, you're getting. So this is kind of the, um, one of the initial attempts at distribution, uh, and it's one that never really got anywhere. Um, the next kind of reduction in, in sharing uh, is what's called shared disk architectures. And the idea here is that each processing device has its own local resources, um, its own local memory, potentially its own local disk, but overall the, the data that's being stored uh, ends up getting uh, distributed across a wide array of different disks, a wide array of different uh, physical locations. Um, so now, 
you have kind of this explicit high uh, I.O. interface, uh, sorry, high uh, latency I.O. interface that you, you kind of know that there's latency going on there, but you still don't have a lot of control. Uh, you just still don't really see uh, where data is flowing, how data is getting physically distributed, distributed across these devices. Um, but it kind of gets you a little bit of the best of both worlds. You have this kind of shared interface, but it's kind of very clear that it's not meant to be a low uh, latency interface. Um, the, one of the most prevalent instantiations of this is, uh, is basically HDFS. So if you've ever used a MapReduce system, this is basically the, uh, the architecture that you see in um, H, the HDFS component of that. Um, one other downside to this is that it's very difficult to get uh, consistency right because all of your disks are spread out because you have lots of different entities interacting with those disks. Um, depending on how uh, much infrastructure you want to build into those disks, it may be very hard to get uh, sequential operations uh, get a the sequencing of those operations correct to the point where you can um, make sure that the data on those disks is consistent. Now finally, uh, or almost finally, um, one thing that's been fairly popular of late is this idea of a shared nothing architecture uh, where you have uh, the database itself consists uh, really of lots of independent databases. You have lots of little tiny components, uh, each performing their own kind of separate tasks, and then you have this big control layer sitting on top of it that communicates with each of these individual uh, components in the system to figure out what kind of, uh, to, to kind of divide the overall data processing task uh, among the individual components. Now, you may have noticed in each of these diagrams, there's been this really big, uh, messy uh, chain of connections. And that kind of has to be there. Uh, depending on what kind of data processing task you're performing, uh, you kind of need that big chunk of uh, communication to, to kind of coordinate between the different components of the system. So the, the difference between these, these architectures is basically where that big uh, chunk of interconnected nodes lives. And these are kind of the, the big extremes of those interconnected nodes. Um, now one of the disadvantages of this particular approach is that you're kind of offloading all of the work up to this client layer. Um, you're, you're kind of, everything that needs to, to happen needs to happen at that layer. So this ends up producing a, makes it very easy to scale because all of the, the work is being done by the client, but it also means that your, um, your clients have to do much more work to get everything uh, running correctly. Um, so the MapReduce infrastructure itself can be thought of kind of in this, uh, in this light. Uh, individual MapReduce tasks don't really, uh, there's very little interaction between the, the uh, individual participants in a, a map task or a reduce task. It's only kind of these uh, intermediate states where you get communication. Uh, the last general kind of architecture that I want to bring up, and this one is uh, one that's kind of uh, more in industry than anywhere else, is this idea of, of a shared log. And a shared log uh, kind of operates like a shared set of disks, but the distinction is that you kind of keep track of uh, each operation as it happens. You kind of build up a record of how the system is uh, changing. And I've been seeing a lot of these uh, kind of crop up in different ways, shapes, and forms uh, in academia, which probably means that within five to ten years, you'll start seeing some of these actually probably even sooner, you'll start seeing some of these in uh, more commercial systems. Uh, Microsoft in particular is very, very aggressively pursuing this, this kind of architecture um, where essentially you have 
a log as the core uh, communication primitive. The main difficulty here is that, well, the, the log, um, as we discussed last uh, on Monday, logs make a really nice way of replicating state. They make a really nice way of uh, distributing uh, state across a variety of different platforms, but now you have to figure out which platforms are uh, interested in a particular piece of data. Um, so while this is uh, very cheap to build and Microsoft has had some really, really impressive uh, scaling results with that kind of general architecture, uh, it ends up being very difficult to um, kind of get that, the infrastructure itself correct. Um, all right, so any questions on uh, architectures and, and kind of the, uh, the way that uh, bring different database components together, or different processing components together? Okay, so that basically concludes the terminology dump. Um, now, I kind of want to get to some of the, the interesting stuff, which is how do you actually parallelize the data processing tasks themselves? So, once again, we, we kind of introduced two different um, kinds of parallelism, uh, serial parallelism and uh, Serial parallelism and then uh, kind of uh, partition parallelism. What we'd like to look at right now is this intra-operator parallelism. This, how do we take a single operator and parallelize that one operator? And kind of the big question that arises whenever you're trying to implement a uh, or the two big questions that arise whenever you're trying to implement a parallel um, operator is how do, you, how do you partition the data? How is the data already partitioned and how are you expecting the data to be partitioned after the operator is complete? Um, really the, the kind of partitioning question is, is kind of the, the main, um, one of the biggest questions. So, Let's say that your, your data is not already partitioned. We've discussed a handful of different ways of uh, spreading that data across a set of different, um, spreading that data out across lots of different partitions. Uh, when we talked about uh, grouping and we, when we talked about uh, different kinds of join algorithms. Um, I'm going to introduce, in addition to the kind of range-based partitioning scheme and the hash-based partitioning scheme that we've already discussed, there's also a possibility that you don't, don't really care uh, about uh, where a given data value ends up. So rather than trying to uh, come up with some clever way of partitioning the data based on uh, hashes, what you could do is just allocate the data and randomly assign it to a particular bucket. Now, why, under which circumstances would we, would we want to do each of these things? So um, when is it okay to do a, this kind of round robin partitioning scheme? Let's back that up. Um, let's say we have a data set and we want to spread it out across a bunch of nodes. What would be an advantage of using something like hash partitioning? We have a key, we have a set of key value pairs and we want to spread those across a bunch of nodes. Why would we, why would we use hash? Say again? Okay, so uh, one, uh, one advantage of hash would be that we 
uh, all of the, the keys uh, with a particular value go to the same node. So if we have multiple keys, uh, if we have a reason to keep uh, things clustered together, we might want to send all of the uh, we might want to send all of the things with one particular key value to one particular node. Okay, so that's an advantage for hash indexing. What about range? Why would we want to split things up based on ranges? What if we're doing something where there isn't a uh, where there isn't a clear cut um, partitioning scheme? Like, um, what if we're sorting uh, age data? Well, that's not. You can round those. Uh, what about um, something like uh, distances? So we want to find, uh, we want, we're doing some kind of operation where we want, where we want to find all of the similar, uh, all similar distances. Distances are key and we want to find all similar distances. Which one would? More generally, when, when would we use, uh, when would we use something like a tree instead of a hash index? Range query. So if we have, um, if we have an ordering over the data and that ordering makes sense, then we might want to partition the data based on its ranges. Now, round robin, when, uh, when does that make sense? When, yeah, if, uh, if we don't care about how the data is partitioned, if there's absolutely no value in, in partitioning uh, the data in any particular way, um, I mean, why, why wouldn't we use hash partitioning in that case? It, hash partitioning is cheap. What's... Uh, balance look, yes, perfect. Uh, so the, uh, the dis there's a disadvantage to both hash and range partitioning in that you have no way of predicting how much data is going to end up in each bucket. So by uh, doing this round robin partitioning, you're, you can essentially guarantee that each bucket that you create is going to have exactly the same number of data values in it. Great. So OK. So the the kind of core primitive that we've encountered in most of our uh, data processing techniques has been kind of this idea of scanning the data. We scan from point A to point B. Um, we can apply a filter over those tuples, uh, get out a set of them. We can apply a, uh, a projection on those uh, tuples. But again, we're, we're kind of scanning over a set of tuples, and then we're doing something with each of them. We're doing something to each of those tuples. So some general observations, uh, or the first general observation is that if you pick your partitioning scheme correctly, um, you may not necessarily need all of the, um, all of the data to process the query that you're, you're posing. So kind of like an index where the index provides you with a specific set of pages that fall into a given range or that uh, hit a given hash bucket. Um, if you choose your partitioning correctly, you may not need all of the machines to uh, spin up and, and uh, perform some sort of um, computation, uh, participate in this overall computation. So let's see where are we uh, we are running a little short on time. So okay. All right. 
So I'm going to start with two basic algorithms, and then we'll continue this on Monday. Uh, the first So in checkpoint two, what did most of you find to be the most time-consuming part of your implementation? External sort, yeah. So kind of the first thing that we want to, uh, the first and probably most obvious thing to try and parallelize is uh, the, the sorting algorithm. So there's a whole bunch of infrastructure in place, a whole bunch of uh, competitions and crazy things going on uh, to get uh, the most efficient sorting algorithms uh, out there. Um, as of last year, uh, there was a system that was able to use 52 nodes to sort um, just shy of a full petabyte every minute. That's kind of crazy. Um, in precise, uh, precisely uh, one trillion records in a little less than two and a half minutes. Um, and this has been kind of surpassed since then. Uh, now that's kind of the, the high end of, of uh, what is currently uh, feasible and there's probably all sorts of uh, things that aren't published that can do better. But how would you approach this problem of parallel sorting? It, just as, as a simpler, yeah? Okay, so uh, one potential strategy, and this is more or less uh, modulo some very precise uh, calibration of uh, system parameters. Uh, this is more or less what each of these systems does. Uh, external merge sort, it works on, uh, it works in, um, on small data. It also works on much larger data. Uh, it also works in, in parallel settings. Uh, you take your data, you split it up into small chunks, uh, and sort each of those chunks in parallel. Well, kind of like you were doing them sequentially right now, you can sort them in parallel, uh, one per machine. So, well, and then you start merging them back together just like you, uh, just like you did uh, in external merge sort. So there's, I mean, a number of basic problems here, you know, picking partition boundaries, um, it's kind of, You'll, you'll see that this, this idea of partitioning becomes uh, kind of the, the core challenge of, uh, of pretty much every par uh, parallel algorithm. Um, the algorithm itself is relatively simple, but then how do you take the data, how do you effect, uh, effectively partition it becomes one of the, the really big ways in which the algorithm can fail. Um, so. But yeah, uh, external merge sort uh, works precisely the same way as it does in, uh, on disk um, in an in-memory, uh, in a parallel setting. Um, another kind of aggregate, uh, sorry, another kind of uh, algorithm that, uh, let's see, we'll get into this a little bit more uh, next week. The, we discussed different ways of parallelizing aggregates, and one of the things that we brought up uh, when we discussed on disk uh, versus, uh, sorry, on disk versus in memory aggregates was this idea of uh, different classes of aggregate functions. Um, distributed, a distributive uh, aggregate was one, uh, or colloquially, uh, you can feel free to interpret that, but colloquially, what would you, uh, how would you characterize a distributive aggregate? Or maybe you could provide an example. What is, uh, what is an example of a distributive ag aggregate? So let's interpret that. Um, if I have this one function, I, I'm trying to aggregate A, B, C, and D, 
would I get the same result? Under what conditions? Uh, what is an example of a function f that, if I use it to aggregate uh, four different results, is going to be the same as if I try and aggregate two in, uh, individual results and then try and aggregate their sum count? Yeah, so sum count. Uh, what are some others? Min, max. Yep. So each of these are what are called uh, a distributive aggregate. Now the difference uh, between that, what's the difference between that and an algebraic aggregate? So G and H here are different types of functions. What, what would that imply to you? Median? Mm. So uh, I have this one big aggregate I'm trying to compute. And I have one function that I can apply to kind of subsets, and then one function to take all of those smaller computations and merge it back into the actual thing that I'm trying to compute. Hmm? What do you mean by merge? Uh, okay, so sort um, sort really isn't much of, uh, isn't precisely an aggregate. So. Um, how would I compute an average? OK, so I need both a sum and a count. Now, the sum and the count uh, independently are not the average value that I'm trying to compute, but they're still a bounded size representation of some intermediate state. And so uh, an algebraic aggregate is one where you have a bounded size intermediate state that you can compute. And then that bounded size intermediate state, in this case the count and the sum, can be then uh, combined into the actual thing that you're trying to compute, the average. Uh, and then finally, a holistic, uh, a holistic aggregate um, is one that you can't, uh, can't decompose into a bounded size representation. So what's an example of that? Mode and median are uh, two very good examples of this. Um, so you need the entire data set because in this case, if I have, let's say I have encountered one, two, three, uh, and then I have another data, uh, another chunk of data, uh, four, five, three. Um, let's make that four fourth. Uh, and another site where I've got one, three, six. Do I have any information to discard any of these values uh, locally? Just looking at these three values, can I decide that any of them are irrelevant? What about here? Uh, when I'm computing the mode, sorry, the, the most common, the most frequently in, uh, occurring uh, number. No. So I mean, I, four here is occur, uh, clearly occurring more frequently than three. But as it turns out, that three is actually the most commonly occurring integer. It's just spread out over uh, all of the sites. So for something like that, I can't really summarize any of the data. Um, now, how, how does this tie into uh, distribution? Well, if I'm computing the sum of 100 different numbers, how, would, how might I parallelize that? OK, so I can split the data up into chunks. I can take uh, the first 20 numbers, add them together. The, first, the, the next 20 numbers, add them together. I kind of decomposed this big operation into lots of smaller operations. And I can, uh, each of those smaller operations are independent. So I end up building this kind of tree. Uh, 
um, this kind of tree of operations that I need to perform. The first layer, I add A and B together, C and D together, and so forth, and I get a number. The second layer, I add each of those results together. And the structure of this diagram should give you a hint as to the answer to the, the following question, which is the last one I'm going to ask. Um, if I'm computing an aggregate in this way, how many steps will it take? Or how many, uh, yeah, how many steps, uh, time increments will it take? Assuming everything, hmm? Log, log base two. So if I'm adding each of these together, it's going to take me uh, a, a logarithmic number of steps. And how much parallelism do I get? Or how, how much can I, uh, how many machines does it take uh, to, to get to that? Hmm? The number of, re well, number of reads divided by two. Um, but yeah, so the first layer, uh, every layer I kind of have the number of machines that are participating, but I'm still getting uh, the total amount of work that I need to get done uh, in a logarithmic number of steps. And any kind of distributive uh, or algebraic aggregate, you can re-express in this form because, well, you can decompose it. Um, all right, so we'll, uh, we'll get back to this on Monday and start discussing uh, a little bit more about parallelism.